The 2010s, like any decade, had its fair share of video game classics. Games like Dark Souls, Undertale, and The Last of Us will be praised for probably decades to come, and will be used as blueprints to develop on in the future. But along with these blueprints, we found marketing schemes that wished to capitalize on the success that they provided. You ever really thought of the term, it's like the Dark Souls of blank? What does that entail? Well, on the surface, they are probably talking about the difficulty the game provides. But the real marketing trick behind this quote is, you believing they are of the same quality. Comparing something to a generally positive product will have the viewer make a correlation of, hey, I like that game. If this is like that, then you know what? I should probably check it out. Now, of course, being burned by this phrase a few times means viewers get jaded and skeptical of the claim. So today we just amusingly exhale, roll our eyes, and disregard that Dark Souls comment altogether. But why are we talking about this? You've read the title of the video, this has nothing to do with it. Well, I brought up that marketing tactic as an example to bring up another I have found even more grating over the past few years, and that's companies selling you on the idea of an experience. Okay, have a good one. Two, as a means of progressing the story, all coalesce to an experience that is more than the sum of its parts. Strong identity for this 16-year-old franchise with a showcase solo shooter experience. Pretty World War II offers a surprisingly fast-paced and fun World War II experience. The campaign features the all-new Super Monkey Ball Step and Roll with the Wii Balance Board, the most realistic Monkey Ball experience yet. Play movie. It's not an uncommon thing to see games trying to advertise you on the idea of their product being something different, something you can have a connection with, an experience. But I feel that very term needs to be unpackaged. What is an experience? What separates experiences from simply enjoying a game? Why are games claiming to be an experience more and more over time? And why should you be playing the Hylix series right now? An event or occurrence that leaves an impression on someone. This is Oxford's definition of an experience, and using this as a base, it means that all those commercials were technically telling the truth. I can't dictate or say what will leave an impression on you, or what in general will influence you. After all, we are different people. But there are things that can be deemed more likely to be an experience than others. For example, I would argue more people ended up having a unique experience on their first playthrough of Journey rather than their first playthrough of Modern Warfare 3. Part of this is due to the fact that the Call of Duty formula has been done multiple times, whether it's by Activision or its competitors. It results in the product not being a unique concept anymore. So, whenever something new and fresh does come out, it feels like a unique experience. Try to remember your first time playing a Battle Royale game or your first Telltale game. Nobody had ever made these style of games before, and when you made that decision to interact with Clementine for the first time, nothing felt quite like it. But that decision will slowly lose its luster after marketing and competition attempts to milk that same feeling over and over and over again. This isn't to say these later products can't be a unique experience for you. I think it ultimately depends on how many products like it you have played before. You may have played Abzu before having played Journey, so in comparison, Abzu felt like the fresher game. Again, it all depends on you and what you deem as unique, but I don't think I'm too far off the mark here. Like many gamers, I myself have been looking for something different than what the status quo has had to offer, and I think you can see that in the games I have been reviewing recently. Horror games that don't follow the conventional run away from the monster, or even a coherent world. I've ended up chasing that want for different titles quite the distance. In fact, I think I'm beginning to play games that border artistic and unique, and just outright weird. Counselor Ronnie reporting for duty. For duty. D -d -d -duty. Drugs make you To say the least, I've experienced a series that I can comfortably say is an experience. Whether you take that as a good one or a bad one is up to you to decide, 
but let me show it off to you for a little bit so you can at least taste what I would say is quite an enjoyable wacky ride. Hilux was a one-man project made by Mason Lindroff in 2015. From just looking at this game for a few seconds, its visuals will probably be the first thing to grab your attention. Almost all this game's visuals were made out of clay, then digitized. Clay being a very malleable substance allows itself to be used to form many shapes and its textures end up looking wholly unique. Why is this important? Because simply making this with 3D graphics software just wouldn't have had the same unique feel. Just look at this island design, it looks blotchy, like it was handcrafted. In fact, while you can't make out thumb patterns, I think you can see where the thumbs were pressed to create the surfaces. These clay designs can be used to make a totally unique and foreign world. Just look at how these basic walls now look alien due to the twisting compound look the clay was able to pull off. That blotchy and handcrafted art style is what initially pulled me into this game. It reminded me of when I was younger and how I would use any toy at my disposal to create my own world. And these handcrafted designs aren't limited, they do go places. Graveyards, forgotten tombs, a massive city, castles, labs, another dimension, and even a nightclub were all included into the game. Character designs are uniform, but are still given a chance to be unique. It's just that most of the enemies in the game have those toy mannequins as a base, and only their head gets changed to reflect their attacks or who they affiliate themselves with. For example, the cone heads are all part of the cone cult, which are these cone statues. And the monoops has this one giant eye which reflects its signature attack, staring at you and making you paralyzed. Most of these designs are unique and either add insight into the character's attacks, their affiliations, or just to the weird wackiness the game is trying to pull off. The game was impressively made in RPG Maker, a program that is known for churning out games that look like this. The art design is already unique, but what honestly sells the game for me personally has to be the combat animations. Every item, spell, and even basic attack has a unique animation made for it. The food items are spun around and deconstruct as if someone had simply drained it rather than having eaten it. Spells all have different animations, some just cast spinning morphing clay chunks, while others erect a book made of meat or handling of some kind of parasite. Your basic attack is a simple snap of your fingers, but my favorite animation has to be for the dynamite. Its incorporation of real video just makes it that much better, and the fact that the item only deals 75 damage with that intense animation is hilarious. The animation the game provides has to be one of the reasons to stick around, and since you're unlocking skills throughout its 2-4 hour playtime, I was hooked the whole time. One last thing that needs to be mentioned about animations would be the incorporation of its backgrounds. These backgrounds are pretty random, with some being a random assortment of colors, and others being an outright digitized parking lot. The game's color palette of purple, yellow, and orange mixed with the wave effect added to the background of every battle makes for a truly hypnotic experience. One that might make some players feel a little sick, so if you're often subject to nausea, I would watch a few videos before buying. The soundtrack to Hylix, while not as eye-catching as the visuals, has some different things going on as well. Initially I thought the soundtrack was just trying to replicate the sound of many alternative indie rock bands. Instead, I feel the soundtrack is just trying to elicit certain tones and emotions, or just trying to contextually make sense. I know this isn't anything new, video game soundtracks have been doing all this for a while, and I'm no expert on music, but some of these tracks just don't make a ton of sense otherwise. For example, the main battle theme you hear throughout the game is a song called Messy Song. This track obviously isn't trying to make a whole lot of sense but it does poke fun at battle themes in general, and contextually makes sense since the weapons the player characters are using are called instruments. Like I said earlier, a lot of these tracks are trying to put off a mood or a feeling, and that feeling is usually a relaxed or somber one. The Ruins has this sickening feel to it, with it building then dropping on an airy guitar sound. 
it constantly feels like a buildup that's going nowhere, a place caught in stagnation, much like ruins would be in our everyday lives. The tomb song is my favorite in the game, it just features a very low-key guitar rift with another guitar playing as an uplifting backing. The sad and quiet tone this song puts off just pairs wonderfully with the visuals, making the tomb a really unique section of the game. While there are tracks that do elicit emotion, there are others that are just straight up strange. The earlier mentioned Messi song doesn't do the game a ton of favors, since it's connected to the earlier enemies, and I believe most new players will come off just thinking the game is weird, which it is, but more in a bad way. The shop song is also very strange. I think it's trying to be quirky, which it does pull off until the deep rumble sounds in the background pop up, making this track just, again, strange. Combat music is pretty good, though often on the chiller side of things. This works well for the general vibe of the game and its gameplay. Combat in Hilux is nothing to really write home about, it features the general list of RPG status effects, and most spells either inflict status or deal damage with a multiplier attached to it. The one thing that does break up the formula is the way HP and mana is added to the player's character. HP is replaced with flesh, and mana is replaced with will. You don't level up in Hylix in the traditional sense, instead you collect flesh, and when you die you get sent to the afterlife where you can then add that flesh into this grinder, which will then add all that flesh as HP to your party. It's a system which requires the player to die in order to get stronger, though there are other benefits to the system, as well as one of the stronger items in the game being found here once the player dies three times. The afterlife also acts as a way to fast travel around the world by using crystals you activate while exploring. Mana, known as Will, can only be upgraded by first finding a paper cup, having Dedu Smolin in your party, and then finding a water cooler. Then you will be able to gain 25 Will per cooler. It's a decently long process, but honestly, you can beat the game without getting a single upgrade. Earlier enemies can be brutal, until you find your first party member. But I found the longer the game goes, with the exception of one enemy, that being the will stealing ghosts, this game is pretty easy. Combat really isn't all that inspiring besides seeing all the enemies and watching every unique animation. Instead, what kept me invested with my short playthrough of Hylix was the exploration. Hylix is a weird game, its visuals, music, and even dialogue are all strange. Most things are not coherent, and the player is never really given direction on what to do or where to go. But that lack of direction was what kept me interested. A world that looks far from our own, with one visual spectacle to the next. The moment I wandered into a teleporter, explored another dimension, then walked into a second teleporter which led me to a house with a party member who was depressed because her gloves were missing, was the moment I knew I was hooked. Bumbling around and pressing on everything was probably what Mason Lindroth expected from us, and the fact that I was rewarded for doing that felt pretty dang good. A couple islands don't ever have to be explored, but it's where some of the best content is. You can get a god spell by exploring a few crooks and crannies and collecting the sage tokens to turn into this TV. You can play music at the club here, all of which is player controlled. And you can even get a spell that turns party members into random NPCs. That way you can view their walk cycles. Sections of this game are just begging to be stared at. Whether they have any other value than that, I don't know, but it's still cool to watch. Oh, and those mad ramblings from all the NPCs are actually randomly generated. Most NPCs talk through a vocab engine which picks random words from a list of adjectives, verbs, and nouns. The main city changes names on every playthrough, and so does the mountain containing the runes, meaning the game is just a whole bunch of word suit. This can be annoying on your first playthrough, but I found it enjoyable on repeats. Hylix just has this air of absurdity that is both hilarious and enchanting easily one of the best parts of the game. Believe it or not, Hylix does have a story, though it's hard to find and it's a pretty simple one. You play as Wayne, a willful rebel who is sick of Lord Gibby's tyranny. You gather your friends, explore the world, and eventually find a rocket to get onto Lord Gibby's moon and kill him. 
It's an incredibly simple story, but that's just the point. Everything we do in between fighting Lord Gibby is just random obstacles in our way from point A to point B. Gibby isn't even impeding our progress besides closing one boat gate. Everything else is just in the way from the world being wacky. We need a ship to get to this island so we connect to a graveyard in the tombs to find it, just because that's where it was parked. We need money to buy a key for the rocket ship so we fake that we got a job at a lab and collect hundreds of thousands of dollars and buy a $99,999 key. The story really is nothing. It's just a few dialogue boxes in these intermissions. But I feel that was the point. The game was so wacky that you kind of just stumbled into the story near the end. Gibby acts like he knows you, but your character never says anything to him. He's just the boss at the end of a nonsensical world. On the Steam store page, Hylix is described as a recreational program with light JRPG elements, and I think that's an accurate way to describe the game. While there are plenty of fights and it does take up about 40% of your time, the exploring aspect of the game takes full center. Most of the world is interactable and most of your time is spent looking at Mason Lindroff's art. It's a short game, lasting me 4 hours on my first playthrough, which is by far the longest it will take you on any completion. Subsequent playthroughs have taken me anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours long. The game is only asking for a total of $2.99, a pretty good bargain for what I think is a good product. I will warn you this game was not made for everyone, and if you are suspect of the product then I'll ask you wait for just a second, because maybe I can sell you on its sequel, Hylix 2. Hylix 2 was released June of 2020, and before I talk about anything else, I need to mention that this is a full-blown game. The original Hylix was an exploration piece, one focus on interacting with its environments. Hylix 2, however, is a video game through and through. Not only has the length of the game been about tripled, but it features far more in-depth combat, platforming, dialogue, and an actual story with cutscenes. This game is asking for a price tag of $15, and while again this game may not be for everyone, I can confidently say this is a product far more in line of a video game rather than just an interesting art showcase. So if you thought the original was far too artsy for your tastes, then please hear me out on this game because I feel that it may have something to offer for you. Much like the original, the visuals are very striking, and this time they edge more on the psychedelic side of things. Every enemy now moves in combat, whether that's with the rhythm of the background or without. Considering the fact that the game's color palette remains similar to the original, and these enemies often bring in usually darker shades, their movements come off as hypnotic, and I caught myself several times just staring at the screen in amazement. Though when compared to the original, the animation makes some of the models come off as glossy, namely the ones that move side to side. The world and town maps have a similar glossy look to it, though I think this was inevitable with the leap to a 3D space. The world isn't simply made out of spiraling clay anymore, and while it loses some of that childlike wonder, it was a necessary step for the player to traverse it. Clear outlines and shadows were drawn on top of models to ensure clarity, and this was a smart move since depth perception was rather difficult in some areas enough as it is. The game no longer moves in four directions. It moves in 8 and has a vertical space to it, something that enriches gameplay, but forced the art to lose a little bit of its charm. This isn't to say the clay designs take a total step back, far from it. Areas where the ground is treated as a flat surface rather than a hilly one get the full blown clay treatment, and it looks great with animation. There are a few more notable areas to talk about art wise. There's about an hour long section where the game takes the appearance of a first person dungeon crawler, it's good looking and I was surprised I wasn't lost as much as I thought I was going to be. Lastly, there's a 2D platforming minigame which looks great as well. Though this comes as no surprise since Mason has been making flash platformers for quite a while. Hylix 2 has a few cutscenes, namely an intro and an outro, and a couple that can be found for story and world building purposes. The original had one cutscene and a few moments of animation like this door opening. These can be seen as choppy, but serviceable. In Hylix 2, however, all the animations are smooth and are placed throughout the game. Every enemy is animated and all of them have unique movements. Some of these are very impressive, especially this fish. 
The most impressive pieces of animation are the few cutscenes in the middle of the game. There is a good mix of live action and stop motion, and it looks just great. The main pull from the original was watching all the hand motions for certain spells, and that comes back in this game almost tenfold. Jesters have been elaborated, and the animations are far smoother than the original. Some of them even have context clues to what they are doing to the enemy or yourself. A standout example is the spell Lightning, which looks fantastic while it swaps from live action to 2D sprite work. The animation makes sense with the spell as well since the caster gets stunned after casting it. The whole x-ray gimmick markets this pretty clearly to us. Item animations look great again. The banana and coffee animations in particular are satisfying to watch. It can't be understated how much work has gone into some of these animations, namely the Bombo spell which has multiple working pieces, including four artifacts that move on their own, the live action hand, and the spinning effect near the end of the spell. Statuses all have animations, which is a nice change from the original, which for the most part use static images. These thematically make sense, like how the leak status is just a tear with ooze spilling out, or how the caffeinated status is a giant spinning coffee cup. The only problem I have found with any of the animations is the layering. Statuses in particular will stay on top of other animations, like here. The loading screen after the battle will also display them, but only some. It really isn't the biggest of problems, though it can be a mess with visual clarity, especially when trying to figure out what you've already inflicted on an enemy. Like I said earlier in the video, I'm no expert when it comes to music, so take what I have to say with a pinch of salt when it comes to the soundtrack. I think objectively speaking, the tracks in Hilux 2 are better and far more fitting for a video game. Most of the tracks in Hilux 2 sound complete and have less of an artsy air surrounding them. The battle tracks in particular are great. They have a relaxed vibe to them, but escalating guitar riffs will often remind the player that they are in a fight. The boss theme maintains the same relaxed feel, though it sprinkles in a lot more guitar. The final boss theme is a different story, it uses a heavy amount of bass. While compared to other final boss themes in other games, it's still relaxed, but the song has a very sinister sound when compared to everything else the game has to offer, and it encaps the soundtrack quite nicely. Now I've compared this to the original game soundtrack quite favorably, and that's because this soundtrack was meant for a video game. The originals is a moody piece, one that sets a tone rather than trying to sound pleasant, and to that game's credit, its soundtrack works well, but that same musical philosophy just would not have worked as well here. There's a story, there's a sensible society, and there are people who talk like normal beings. Having some of the outright goofy songs just wouldn't have made a lot of sense here contextually. Some tracks do go into the more artsy side of things. The second half of New Mulu's town theme comes to mind. What impressed me the most about the soundtrack was its ability to harken back to the original when it comes to the use of its instruments. The original had a healthy amount of bass, guitar, surf guitar, keyboard, electric drum set, and the Thurman. Most if not all these make a return in this sequel, despite the complete change in the style of music, they work really well here. The surf guitar and theremin in particular seem to have become a staple for the series. If there is to be another entry, which is kinda hinted at, then I wouldn't be shocked if they both make another appearance. Mason included another musician this time around, Chuck Solomon, and to say it's simply, he did a fine job and I'm interested in seeing what he produces next. The biggest change from the original to Hilux 2 is the general gameplay loop. Hilux 2 does have that same exploring a wacky world idea. Wayne's movements are unnatural, his steps are over exaggerated, and he straightens out like a piece of wood when jumping and gliding. The world around him looks funky, though there is far more direction in telling the player where they need to go. So this time around, the player won't find themselves stumbling into another dimension. Instead, they will just explore mostly empty temples and castles. Hilux 2 is an almost top-down view game, but everything on the map is treated as a 3D space. The player can sprint, dodge roll, air dodge, and glide giving the game a surprising amount of verticality. These platforming movements get used sparingly, but are integral for a few puzzles in the game. What they do allow is the player avenues to move past the game faster. The air dodge in particular allows you to traverse the map quickly and avoid battles, something that repeat playthroughs and speedrunners alike will both enjoy. The main change between games is the heightened focus on combat, and how the JRPG system can be expanded upon. 
JRPG combat has been done hundreds of times over, with most games just adding in a gimmick or two to try to keep it fresh. But when thinking about what makes this style of combat more engaging is the amount of ways the player is given to respond to an enemy. In Hylux's case, they expanded the amount of statuses the player can inflict. Statuses in most games change the pacing of a fight. Whether the player now has to use a new attack, recover, or defend in response is dependent on the game. Hylix 2 has a very large list of statuses, and most of them influence the game in several ways. Leak lowers healing and deals damage over time, burning deals damage over time, and it interacts in special ways with some of the game's trickier enemies, like Pullman, which does not allow this enemy to multiply while being burned. Lagging causes the person inflicted with it to move last no matter what their speed stat is, and Foamed is a defensive status that grants bonus health and an immunity to certain statuses. There are plenty more of these, but we would be here for quite a while if I ran through all of them. Other games have added tons of statuses before, but what makes these ones shine are two things. One of course, being the animations, which look great, but two being how well balanced this game really is. A lot of JRPGs have the problem of jobber level enemies not posing any threat to our group of heroes. So they are deliberately cannon fodder to feed the player a feeling of success and oftentimes to pad out game length. Hylix 2 jumps over this hurdle in a few ways. One, your characters are semi-expendable. Of course you don't want to lose a character during the middle of a fight, but if they do go down, they immediately respawn after the battle, and the player is always given ample amount of time to find a health source. This means items don't have to be spent to recover from a fight, and a character doesn't lose XP from being knocked out. In fact, the game doesn't have any form of XP. Like the original, when you win a fight, you pick up meat, which can then be exchanged for health in the afterlife. The afterlife is far more accessible this time around, with the fast traveling portals connecting directly to it, and with a new spell that instantly kills your entire party on cast. With the player not really needing to fear a lost battle, the game can make itself harder by having enemies with larger health bars and simultaneously lowering the players. The player has a surprisingly small amount of HP, and enemies, particularly in the early game, can almost match it. Most enemies have items as well, allowing them to heal themselves up in mid-fight. This makes the player's choice of statuses that much more important, and since it's fairly difficult to raise mana this time around, two or even one spell cast might leave your character unable to cast anything else. Do you cast Dissolution to lower the amount of damage on the caveman's AoE attack, or do you cast Soul Crisper with the chance of Tyro leaving the fight due to having the burn status on them? The choice is up to you, and one mistake could cause a wipe or a clean victory. One last great status I should talk about is the Charge status which takes a turn to set up. Then, depending on the next spell casted, the player can get bonuses. Foam Armor, when charged up, casts a spell on the whole team, and Wave Artificer causes extra random attacks to be dealt to the enemy. Charged is an important skill, and one that needs to be used carefully, since doing anything else other than casting a spell will cause the status to go away with no benefit. While Hylix 2 remolds JRPG combat in a good way, it isn't all perfect, some things seem pretty unbalanced, and the game suffers from a few difficulty spikes. Namely the start of Foglast and the Labyrinth. They both have some difficult fights, one where the enemies can put a little too much damage on the player in too short of a time. I've had several occasions where the entire enemy team gang up on one member of my party and they are dead or almost dead after one turn. There are just a few enemies that seem to be a little too strong when compared to others, that being the Fierce Courted with its reactive shield and the Limber Trulicent which has an insane amount of single target burst damage. You die easily, but so can your enemy, a pretty great combat system that doesn't make the player feel all that punished for losing a fight. To round this all out, Hylix 2 has an actual story and one that harkens back to the first game pretty dang well. You play as one of many Waynes and are told evil agents are trying to resurrect Gibby, the evil king from the first game. You go to a nearby kingdom to get some information, and it's discovered that the king has been kidnapped. You meet with Pongorma and Didismolin and free the king. He tells you that evil agents of Odesire already know the location of Gibby's burial site and have shielded it off so you can't disturb them. You go to the facility where the shield is being produced and find Samasanuosa. You beat a worm, go to Foglast and fight Odesire, it's too late and Gibby has been resurrected, which kills you and transforms the world. This is a nice callback to the original with all the citizens talking in word soup again, implying Gibby's influence is what is driving the world into chaos instead of it being naturally the way it is. 
you now are given the option to find the hidden sages and unlock the ultimate bombo spell, or you can just go straight to Gibby and fight him one last time. After the game is over, you have a concert scene again, and an ending is given to the player which is up for your own interpretation. Of course I skimmed details here, which can be gathered by talking to your team on your ship, or some of the random NPCs, but this game is very simple, much like the original. Its story is no masterpiece, but does enough to keep the player interested, giving us a reason to go from point A to point B. The Hylix series is something truly unique. It not only throws an incredibly odd but charming art style at the player, but it found itself breaking out of its strange shell and becoming a normal game of its own. If you're looking for a new experience, then I urge you to try out the original, because I can honestly say its lax approach of a structured game is like nothing I've ever played before. And if you're just looking for a spin on the tried and true JRPG style of a game, then check out Hylix 2, which not including its wild visuals still does enough to stir up the JRPG pot. They can both be found on Steam and Itch.io. Thank you for watching, I hope you subscribe, and I hope you have a good day.